Ready? Here we go with the Thanksgiving Cornish hen. We're up at 190 for the ISEC and 180 on the outside. Get the, throw a couple in there and then slam it down. What the heck? You know, this is on the inside right here at 17 uh, degrees inside. inside. And on the outside, we got 132, right? And it's gonna drop down. I'll probably go down to about 105 or something and then come back up. My research group began developing insulated solar electric cooking in 2015, where you just take a solar panel and you connect it directly to a heater and heat your food inside of an insulated chamber. And this is really great because solar energy is the cheapest way to generate electricity right now, and it's getting cheaper, and we can cook without emissions and without deforestation. However, some people don't want to cook in the day when the sun is shining, and in order to keep the costs low, we have a low power solar panel. In this case, it's 100 watts. And this requires us to cook throughout the course of the day. And so if you want more power, we need to store this 100 watts over a long period of time and dump it in a short period of time into the food. And you can do this with a battery, but that requires an expensive battery, which after about a year will go bad, and then you have environmental consequences of that, and you have to buy a new one, and you need charge controllers. So instead, we take this heater, and we put it in a pot inside of a pot. Here we have a phase change material that melts at 100, about 120 degrees Celsius. And the heater is immersed in that. And so over the course of the day, the electrical energy melts this phase change material inside of a well-insulated chamber. And you can dump your food in at the end of the day when the sun goes down, and it will very quickly transfer that thermal energy to the food. So this phase change thermal storage allows the user to cook after dark and to cook with much greater power than is used to initially melt the phase change material. Additionally, these can be made locally in rural areas for less than $20 and last forever. Did I say last forever? Uh, well, we'll talk about some of the problems in a moment, but I think it's worth stating that I've used this almost every day in my kitchen for the last six months, and it's really convenient. Um, I cycle the erythritol up to 180 Celsius, and when the erythritol is hot and the food is cold, we get about 1,000 watts for the first minute. And then as the temperature of the erythritol comes down and the food comes up, the power drops off, but the food is already hot. And so it, it cooks relatively quickly. So for instance, that Thanksgiving Cornish hen, um, came up to 80 degrees Celsius in the middle of the hen in 14 minutes. And we cooked it for 35 minutes, so it was 99 Celsius. And then the bean and potato curry cooked in about an hour and a half after that because the erythritol was kind of cool by that point. And then made gravy in about 15 minutes. I've cooked eggplant and stir fry in a variety of rice and potato dishes on it routinely. Um, fried eggs and sandwiches, and it really works quite great. We made a pretty airtight seal around the rim of the lid in order to vent the vapors out of the insulation so it doesn't soak the insulation over a period of time. And consequently, the air inside the chamber is displaced with water vapor. And so everything heats pretty fast in kind of a heat pipe-like fashion. Two problems that we've worked with are supercooling and thermal degradation of the erythritol. So at high temperatures, everything is liquid and the erythritol convectively cools on the inner pot and we get pretty high power. And so largely I cook with the erythritol uh, above the solidification point. But if we have to cook something larger over a long period of time, you expect that the erythritol will lose thermal energy and when it gets to 118 Celsius, it will begin crystallizing and release this heat of fusion, which is pretty large. It has a heat of fusion of about that of water. However, what we find is it often cools well below the melting point. And at, uh, at these lower temperatures, then you, you, know, you can't bring something to a boil. And so here you can see that um, the erythritol drops down well below its crystallization point. And we also see 
that it has two crystallization temperatures, about 105, 106, and 118. And both these are documented in the literature. But supercooling hasn't proved to be a problem because we can't control it. We can force crystallization by inserting a thick wire coated with solid erythritol into the liquid erythritol to see the crystallization and it crystallizes very fast as you can see in these data. So supercooling is not a problem. However, in cycling this to 180 Celsius several times a day over the course of months, the erythritol thermally degrades, which means the temperatures drop. It supercools to a lower temperature if we let it supercool and the crystallization temperatures are lower. And the literature claims that you also get a reduction in the specific heat and the heat effusion of the substance. So it effectively loses its efficacy as a phase change medium. And so what do you do? There's a number of things we could do. We can look at other phase change media. We can try to understand more about what causes it to degrade. We can just use it as is and recognize that in time, the amount of energy it holds is going to decrease, or we could reduce the temperatures that we cycle to, to lower the thermal degradation. Oh, lastly, we can just change the erythritol on a more frequent basis. Another challenge that we found is the erythritol, the hot erythritol is pretty corrosive and that over several months cycling to 180 Celsius every day, we've actually dissolved the high temperature silicone insulation on the wires and then it dissolves the wires, they, they electrolyze. So we have to protect the wires. We can either use PFA Teflon coated wires, they don't dissolve in the erythritol or we can just coat the wires with either a high temperature epoxy or aluminum covering. So what are we doing with this now? Well, it works pretty well. And so we're looking to disseminate it. Why are we not building this in an industrialized setting, leveraging the economies of scale? Well, we think one, if they're built in small enterprises in low income communities, then the resources and the labor is gonna be very inexpensive. Also, I found I've learned a lot using and building these. And in order to learn faster, if we have a diversity of different people building them and using them, we will gain information from different directions and the development process will go faster. And lastly, our intention is to benefit low-income communities. And so if they're using it, why not build that capacity to, to construct and bring revenue into local enterprises? We have some funding through UK Aid and we started a small company in Ghana and we've also reached out to international collaborators, small enterprises, to help them build it and subsidize them. So we have groups. Oh, well, wait, Grace and Olivia are giving another talk to talk about the dissemination of this technology. So please see Grace and Olivia's talk in this ethos conference as well. Thank you.